left is the Center for Life Science Village. One of the city's most striking landmarks, the Life Science Center is famous for being the first people in Europe to be granted a license for stem cell research on human embryos, allowing work on treatments for conditions including diabetes, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. Scientists based in the center were the first to successfully clone a human embryo in 2005. Inside the Science Museum, you can journey back to the beginning of life with lots of hands-on displays and interactive games.
We're now approaching the Royal Victoria Infirmary, or the RVI as the locals call it, which dates back to 1906. During World War I, the infirmary became a unit of the first Northern General Hospital, treating wounded service personnel. In the grounds is a statue of a young Queen Victoria, one of the few statues to portray her in her younger years. After her death in 1901, all institutions bearing her name were given items of her clothing, with the RBI being granted two pairs of the Queen's bloomers, which summed up her attitude to the city. We'll have more on that one later in the tour. The hospital is now home to the Great North Children's Hospital and the Sir Bobby Robson Cancer Trials Research Centre. dating back to 1888. The university was originally affiliated with Durham University and became a university in its own right in 1963. There are two world-class universities in our city with over 35,000 students studying here. is for the Great North Museum, Hancock. Originally built in 1884 as a natural history museum to house the growing collections of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. The museum was originally named after John Hancock, who was instrumental in securing the funds to build it. The museum is now home to the Living Planet Gallery, which is spread across two floors and tells the story of wildlife and habitats in the region. Also on the ground floor, the Hadrian's Wall Gallery enables visitors to discover the detailed history of the nearby World Heritage Site as well as a wealth of archaeological finds from across the 73 mile stretch of Hadrian's Wall. In front of us is Newcastle Civic Centre, which was opened in 1968 by the late King Olaf V of Norway. Newcastle's connections to Norway have always been strong and it's suggested the famous Geordie dialect is based on that of the Norwegian settlers who've been here since the raids of the 8th century. You may notice on top of the Civic Centre, 12 bronze seahorse heads sitting proudly above the Copper Green Tower. They've been placed to signal the visit. Approaching the hay market, an area named after the market where local farmers bought their hay, but that was a long time ago. Just to the left of Haymarket Metro Station, you'll see Northumberland Street the city's famous shopping street with some of our biggest stores. From 1928 to 1967, this was part of the main A1 road route from London to Edinburgh, but the streets changed a lot since then and was pedestrianised in 1999.
Our next stop is for the Lane Art Gallery and Northumberland Street. The Lane is the Northeast principal art gallery displaying a wide ranging exhibition program catering for all tastes and ages. Originally opened in 1904, the museum building was a gift from a local wine merchant, Alexander Lane, and is grade two listed. The pavement in front of the museum is paved with glass and resin slabs which curve up at the space's edges, giving the appearance of a fabric carpet and is aptly named the Blue Carpet. Did you know that windscreen wipers were invented in Newcastle? Gladstone Adams was the official photographer of Newcastle United Football Club. He drove to London in 1908 to photograph the FA Cup final. On his drive back to Newcastle in the snow, he had to stop several times to clear his windscreen. It was then that he came up with the idea of the windscreen wiper. Though he filed for patent for his version of the windscreen wiper, it was never manufactured. American inventor Mary Anderson beat them to the punch, inventing the wiper that we use today. Back then it was more of a manual process. Motorway, our journey takes us to the east of the city, towards the Ousburn Valley. Our next stop is New Bridge Street, a light here for Gibson Street Baths. The Great Two listed property opened in 1907 as a municipal swim pool, public baths and wash house. Designed by F.H. Holford, it's believed to be one of the oldest surviving bathhouses in the UK. The baths had separate men's and women's entrances, which can still be seen today and is notable for its ornate tiles and glazed dome ceiling. During the Second World War, the pool was used by the fire service as a reservoir for water used to put out fires caused by air raids. The baths were closed in 1965 and the swimming pool was later boarded over, with the main hall being used for badminton courts until the summer of 2016. Even though the building is no longer in use, it's still worth a visit, as you can see the building in its original style. rebellion. Whilst the Northumbrians supported the Jacobites, the people of Newcastle were loyal to King George, and it's believed that Geordie was a local term meaning George. There was also a Geordie Miner's safety lamp and that was invented by George Stevenson. Either way, the name has stuck. is at the Biscuit Factory, the UK's largest independent commercial art, craft and design gallery set in the heart of Newcastle's cultural corner. The building was previously used in the manufacturing of biscuits, hence the name The Biscuit Factory. 
In 2002, the biscuit factory underwent a sympathetic refurbishment, ensuring that many of the original and characterful facets of the building, such as the beams and brickwork, were maintained. It now showcases and sells the work of over 250 artists and makers in seasonally changing exhibitions. joining us on the Toon Tour. Don't forget that your Toon Tour ticket is valid all day on all Go Northeast buses. You can also use your ticket to get a discount off many attractions in and around Newcastle and around the Northeast. More information can be found on our Toon Tour leaflet or on our app or website. You can leave the bus at any of our stops if there's somewhere you'd like to explore and catch us later on any of our other services. Download the Go Northeast app to plan your journey and track your buses in real time. Our journey now takes us towards the Quayside, one of the most important parts of Newcastle and Gateshead's heritage. In the late 1800s, the River Tyne was Britain's second most important river, becoming the what? focal point of the golden age of coal, iron and steam, varying from coal mining and railway engineering to shipbuilding all along the Tyne. For centuries, Newcastle was recognised as the home of coal, leading to the popular phrase, taking coals to Newcastle. On our tour is Forsyth St. Anne's Church. The Grade 1 listed church was built between 1767 and 1768 in a dignified English Renaissance manner from designs by William Newton, the most successful Newcastle architect of his day. Stones from the nearby Newcastle Town Wall, which used to run along the quayside, were used in its construction. As we head down towards the River Tyne, we pass the site of the former Tyne Tees television studios, which were on your right as we turn on the city road. The studios were famous for producing the cult 1980s music show, The Tube, presented by Paul Yates and Jules Holland, which ran for five years with bands like The Proclaimers, ZZ Top, U2 and Frankie Goes to Hollywood, all appearing on the famous Newcastle stage. Newcastle side of the quayside. On your right is the law courts, 
designed by local architect Napa Cullerton and built by John Lay. It's constructed in red sandstone from Dumfrieshire at a cost of 17.1 million and was completed in 1990. The next stop is the main stop for the quayside. I like here to take in the views, enjoy something to eat or drink in one of the great cafes and restaurants, or just relax and enjoy the atmosphere. is for the Guild Hall. This is the historic heart of the Quayside and was formerly the medieval heart of Newcastle, home to many wealthy merchants. Some of their timber frame houses still exist today. Take a look to your right to see the plaque above the first floor window where Bessie Surdies eloped back in 1772. Bessie was the daughter of a prominent local merchant who didn't approve of her relationship with John Scott. The lovers eloped to Scotland to marry, and her father then accepted their marriage some months later. In time, it was a wise choice, as John Scott went on to become Lord Eldon and was made Lord Chancellor, one of the highest legal positions in the country. We're now heading towards the Sage Gateshead and St Mary's Church, the next stop on our tour. The Sage Gateshead is a home for music and musical discovery, which opened in 2004. It provides unrivaled facilities for people of all ages to make, hear and learn about music. Why not take a walk through its glass fronted concourse with excellent views across the River Tyne and of the Tyne Bridge. The building has some great places to eat and drink. On your left, you will see St. Mary's Church, which dates from the 12th century and is a Grade 1 listed building. For many years, this building was the only church in Gateshead and has often been described as Gateshead's mother church. Adjoining the church is its graveyard, which closed to burials in 1853. This houses a number of well-carved and artistic 18th and early 19th century gravestones. So why don't forget that your ticket is valid all day, so you've got time to explore.
ahead of us is Trinity Square, with Tesco Extra being the most noticeable part. Until recently, a giant car park stood in the centre of Trinity Square, but was demolished to make way for the regeneration of the town centre. The area was instantly recognisable as being the filming set for Michael Caine's popular movie, Get Carter. Quite a few famous people were born in Gateshead, from William Hawkes, who founded his company Hawkes & Co, which eventually became one of the biggest iron businesses in the north, Sir Joseph Swan, whose experiments led to the invention of the electric light bulb, and William Wales, a stained glass maker who designed Saltwell Towers in 1860. You can hop off at Central Station to catch our Voltra 54 service to Saltwell Park. As we approach our next stop, Tynebridge North, you'll see 55 Degrees North, which is the building in the centre of the roundabout, so named because of the city's latitude being 55 Degrees North of the Earth's equator. Prior to being named 55 Degrees North, the building was known as Swan House, after Sir Joseph Swan. We're now heading along Pilgrim Street. Pilgrim Street is believed to be the oldest road in Newcastle. Its name is connected with the Pilgrims, who passed along it and through the Pilgrim Gate in the town walls to visit St Mary's Chapel in Jesmond. On your right you'll see what used to be Warswick Street bus station which opened in 1928, shortly after the Tyne Bridge. The bus station closed in 1996 and was temporarily used as a car park until it was demolished in January 2021 to give way to a redevelopment. As we leave Market Street, on your right you'll see Gray's Monument, a 135 foot high monument named after locally born Earl Grey, who became Prime Minister in 1830. Earl Grey was famous for steering through the Reform Act, despite facing a hostile parliament and also reducing his own salary. Earl Grey is also remembered for the blend of tea that bears his name, supplied to him from China by the tea merchant Twinings. To your right, you'll see the Granger Markets, originally opened in 1835, visit with only a short walk up to it.
We're now approaching our next stop for the Castle Keep and St. Nicholas Cathedral. St. Nicholas Cathedral was granted the status of cathedral in 1882, which was the same year that Newcastle became the city. However, the exterior of the building dates back to the 15th century. On display on the south wall is a portion of one of the supports of the original Roman bridge built over the time by Emperor Hadrian. The cathedral was used as a lighthouse to guide ships for hundreds of years by lighting a fire inside the lantern tower of the cathedral. The castle keep which stands on the site of the former Roman fort of Pontalius was built there due to its commanding position with views up and down the river. The original castle was built in 1080 by Robert Curthouse, the eldest son of William the Conqueror. It was partly rebuilt for Henry II in 1168 and the keep is part of Henry's work. The castle is the reason that the city now has its name, with it being the new castle. Hop off and have a look. You can save 20% on entry when you show your two tour ticket. On your right is the Stevenson Memorial, depicting a standing figure of George Stevenson, flanked by four seated figures, representing a miner, a plate layer, an engine driver, and a blacksmith. George Stevenson was seen as the father of railways, and was born locally in Wylam in the Tyne Valley. He supervised the development of the first public railway between Stockton and Darlington in 1825. the Royal Station Hotel and the Central Station. The Central Station was built between 1845 and 1850 and it was designed by John Dobson, becoming the first covered station in the world and is one of only six Grade 1 listed rail stations in the UK. It was officially opened on August the 29th, 1850 by Queen Victoria. The day was declared as a local holiday and the celebration banquet was held at the Royal Station Hotel. However, the celebrations didn't last long as the manager of the hotel sent the bill to Queen Victoria and she was not amused. After this, it's told that she pulled the blinds down every time the Royal Train travelled through Newcastle and it explains why the Royal Victoria Infirmary were gifted her bloomers after she died. 